And uh, okay, so we're ready to roll. So tonight we're gonna to talk about tomatoes. And um, tomatoes is something I can talk a long time about, so I have to kind of narrow it down, so sorry. But um, the first thing is, um, let's talk about the types of tomatoes on that. Uh, tomatoes are classified as um, determinate and indeterminate, okay? What that means is that a determinate tomato kind of reaches a point and stops. It's kind of like you put it in a tomato cage and that's about the size it gets. The, and then the indeterminate literally just keeps growing on that. It grows all summer long. If you plant it in a cage, it goes to the top of the cage, it goes to the bottom of the cage, it just keeps growing on that. So the, and the difference kind of between them is the determinant tomato has a tendency to produce, I'm gonna say all at once, you get almost two crops out of it. You'll get a big gush, you know, you'll, you might have almost, you know, 20 or 30 tomatoes ripen at one time. And then it kind of almost like it's rest, but it, what it's doing is, is growing the next round. And then it produces again. So, which is really good if you want to can them or freeze them or something, you want them all at once. I want to take care of this. I don't want to mess with it anymore. But if you, and this is my opinion, if you're wanting tomatoes to eat all the time, I would do an indeterminate because you get tomatoes all the time. You know, you get some and then some more ripen next week, some more ripen next week, so the week after week after week after. The disadvantage is they're tall on that and they keep going. Now, there's nothing wrong with taking them and you know mulching and let them go to the top of the cage come down put some mulch on them and just let them go across the ground or down off the the raised bed or so you know my tomatoes in the raised beds when I, when they get going i have two bed I, the beds are side by side and they're probably like 24 inches apart maybe and um i can't go down that one side because the tomatoes have plopped over it i don't care i go around you know but i have tomatoes all the time i i am a person who likes tomatoes i'll eat them you know, if I make a, sometimes I make BLTs for breakfast. If I do, I have them three meals a day on that. Uh, most of the time I'll have them for dinner and supper. So I want them producing all the time. The determinate tomatoes won't do that for me, but the indeterminate to do on that. And usually, um, like when we have our tomatoes here at the nursery, we break them down into the, in, when you go into the greenhouse and look, We'll have a sign that says determinant. We'll have a sign that says indeterminate. So you can tell by that. The tags will tell you sometimes. Um, sometimes they don't, but that's a way to tell. And then we've got lists too. We can look it up if we don't. And we've got a tomato sheet that tells us which ones are, and we can get you a copy of that too. But that's kind of the main difference. And then you have, I'm going to say variety differences. You have, um, and I don't know if I would say big tomatoes, but you have big tomatoes, you have little tomatoes, you have patio tomatoes, you have cherry tomatoes, you have um, uh, Roma type tomatoes, and then you have heirlooms. So there's a bunch of different varieties within that. Okay, cherry tomatoes, almost all your cherry tomatoes are indeterminate. They just keep going and they produce and they produce. Cherry tomatoes are the little guys. They're, I would say, as a general rule, maybe ping pong ball size or less on that. Um, you know, again, it's personal preference. A lot of people love the cherry tomatoes. Personally, I don't care for them because I don't want to pick them all. You know, it's a never ending job picking them. Uh, but they do produce a bunch and they traditionally produce a little bit better in the hot weather than some of your other varieties do on that. But then your patio tomatoes are definitely a, a determinant tomato. They're a short one. Usually, um, you know, we've had some tomatoes. Uh, patio picnic is the one I really like. The plant might get a foot tall on that. So that tells you, I can put that on the patio big time. The fruit, the thing I like about it, the fruit is probably uh, probably the size of a golf ball, maybe a little bit bigger. So it's a good size tomato. It's not a little baby one. And they produce, for us, they produce very well. Um, the first year we planted some, um, I remember going out and picking it and having to use my shirt to catch it, to carry them because we had so many on that. So it's a, I, I think it's a pretty good producer. Um, and then your heirloom tomatoes are your old, I'm going to say old fashioned tomatoes. Okay. Heirlooms, um, getting a little technical, but they're open pollinated, which means if you grow a Cherokee purple tomato and it's the only tomato you grow, you can take the seed from it and next year it will be a Cherokee purple tomato. 
most of your, a lot of your tomatoes, okay, your patio picnic is a hybrid, okay? They've crossed A and B and got C. And so if you take the seed from that, you might get D, E, or F, you might get A, you might get, you know, D, you know, who knows? So you don't know what you're getting with hybrids, but the heirlooms, the kicker on heirlooms, if you're going to keep the seed is you need to keep it by itself. Because if you have it, uh, you know, a, a Cherokee purple there and you have a jet star over here, they're going to cross and you don't have a Cherokee purple. You're going to have some hybrid. It might be really good. It may not on that. You know, sometimes they'll be, that's how new varieties come. They cross A and B and get C and say, this is a really good one. And, you know, it could be sometimes the disadvantage, let's say, to, to hybridizing or to do it yourself or saving your seed is it definitely not, isn't the same tomato. So it could be better. It could be worse. It could be juicier. It could be have a hard um, uh, skin. You know, um, it could be smaller. It could crack more. So I'm not saying don't do it. But what I would say is if you decide to keep some seed, don't make that your only tomato. You know, plant one or two of ones that you like and you know so that you have something in case it turns out really nasty on that. There's also grafted tomatoes, which sounds bizarre. Um, and to me, what sounds bizarre is, is um, that they graft them onto some of these new hybrids. But the grafted tomato, what they do is they literally graft the tomato top onto a rootstock of a, of a, I'm going to say it's not really a wild tomato, but it's a much hardier tomato. The reason they started doing it is because of uh, farmer market type people. They put, you know, tomatoes in the, in the summer, the first tomato gets to sell for a whole lot more than it does in July and August. So they wanted the earliest tomato. So they found that they could put them in a hoop house and they would ripen quicker. And so then they could charge a little more for those early tomatoes. Well, the problem is, is you build this hoop house and it's set, it's there. And um, we'll talk a little bit about tomato diseases, but you plant the tomatoes in the same spot year after year after year after year after year, you're gonna, you can run into some disease problems. And obviously some tomatoes are more susceptible to other than others. And so that's what they found out is that they started getting disease. And most of the soil borne diseases is the diseases that are in the soil are in the soil and the way you, I'm gonna say eradicate them, and sometimes you don't, but the way you eradicate it is you do not plant anything for two or three or four years. Well, they put the house up there, they don't want it a house that they aren't producing anything in for four years. So um, they develop these, I don't know who thought of it or figured it out, but they can graft the tomatoes and the grafts are much more resistant to the diseases and then also the plants will produce more. Even the good ones that you have that produce really, really well, produce better with the grafted rootstock. So you'll have some of those. You'll find that they are um, uh, more expensive because it's, you know, they literally take and cut the, cut the, the uh, uh, top off of the um, rootstock and then put a tomato on it and they have a little, it's kind of like a clothespin they use for the tomatoes and they put it on and then they put it in a, a warm place uh, for two or three days and kind of let it um, heal over and then they have a grafted tomato. So it's kind of cool on that. But so that you have different varieties that way. But, uh, and, and what you use is just kind of personal preference. I'm gonna go over the tomatoes first and then we'll talk about maybe some um, soil and that type of thing. But um, so when, when you plant tomatoes, you know, the better the soil, the better they're gonna do. Tomatoes are the only plant you can do this to, um, only um, vegetable, let's say. Um, if you've ever looked closely at a tomato plant, the stem is all fuzz on that. That fuzz, if it's buried, will turn into roots, okay? So visualize a tomato plant, okay? And even, you know, when I buy them, or well, I don't buy them, I take them home. I guess I do buy them, but when I take them home, I, I mean, this is, what, this is the exact opposite of what they say to do but I look for the tallest plant, okay? And I'm gonna take, and I'm gonna bury that plant really deep. I may have a plant that I take home that's a foot tall. And when it is done being planted, it might be three inches high. Okay, the reason I do that is because all those hairs I talk about are going to turn into roots. And when they turn into roots, all of a sudden I have a one foot deep root system fairly quick compared to it doing itself on that. 
and and then also it's down in the soil where well and it depends on your soil but i have really good soil all the way down so then i have some good soil for it to grow into that's going to hold the moisture it's going to take off and go um, sometimes people will take a tall tomato and bury it horizontal and then have it come up the advantage to that is that then it's close and there's advantages and disadvantages the advantage to that is that it's closer to the soil surface so it warms up quicker and it takes off and goes the disadvantage is it's not a foot deep anymore it's just a foot long on that which is okay but i like i like the idea of depth you know it's it's planted a foot in the ground there's much more moisture it's cooler down there a foot than it is right on top of the soil on that so that's kind of um, i'm going to say a little trick uh, when you plant, you want to just take the leaves that are there and break them off. I just throw them into the, the hole and they'll eventually break down and be organic matter. Um, timing as far as planting. Okay. Um, okay. This is what I do and then I've learned a few things. Okay. The first thing I say is I have super, super good soil that I plant my tomatoes in. I have them in raised beds, but it's really good and it's about 15 inches deep. I don't plant mine until Memorial Day. Okay. Now, you, what I tell people is I work at a garden center, so that's the first day we have off. So then that, that's why I plant, okay? But also, and then you're, you're sitting there in the back of your mind thinking, well, if you plant them more, when are you harvesting these things? Well, actually, I harvest them fairly early on that. The soil's warm, so they take off and go. And I do the bigger plants. I don't do small ones. Um, well, sometimes I do, but the bigger ones, this, I'm talking about the bigger ones. I will have tomatoes about a week after you do on it because the soil's warm that is they don't stutter step they you plant them it's warm they take off and go on that so um the earliest i've had them and, and that was probably the year is uh, i think it was june 26th on that now normally you get them around the fourth of july on that but it was just a year that everything was right and they took off and, and went and that was planted on uh memorial day so that gives you an idea of, of the potential on that um, you know, I would say, I usually tell people to plant on uh, around Mother's Day on that. You're past the frost chance. Okay, now I say that, you come out here, I don't know if you will next week, but in, you know, first part of April and middle of April even, we're gonna have some tomatoes out here. You know, um, I, you know, people ask me, well, you know, should I plant them? And you know, what I usually tell them is, okay, plant them and then you'll come back and get some more. So yeah, go ahead and plant them you know, because it's too early. And even if it doesn't frost anymore, they don't like cold weather. They just sit there and shiver on that. If you wait until they're, it's warmer, they take off and go, you know, with mine, I am not covering my tomato plants on that. And so I don't have to, I don't worry about that. You know, if you plant them the first to middle of April and it's nice, okay, like today, it's great. Well, you know what? It's supposed to get 31 degrees or 33 degrees. Uh, I don't know if it's tomorrow night or the next night. Well, that's not gonna be happy, so you're gonna to have to cover it. You know, that's a royal pain. Um, you know, now March is pretty early, but we can still get frost in April. So, you know, my, my word to you is be patient on that so that then you can, um, you know, you're not really gaining anything. You may feel better about doing it, but be patient on that. So, um, uh, and then what I do when, and this kind of leads to other things. When I plant, um, okay, couple couple words to the wise. Okay, uh, I'm gonna back up one second because I just thought of this. Your grafted tomatoes, um, you can tell where they're grafted. It's a little scar there. It's like a bulge, kind of like a scar or, or a wound on your, like if you cut yourself, how, how it scars over. Um, you do not want to plant them super deep because if you do, then they make their own rootstock and you no longer have the um, advantages of having a grafted tomato. So you will see where it's grafted. It's usually close to the soil line. So do not bury grafted tomatoes any deeper. All the others, you can do that. Um, you can even do, um, if you do them in containers, you can do uh, bury them deeper. Uh, I didn't talk about it, but if you're gonna do container tomatoes, I would suggest using the determinant or things like the patio that are a little bit smaller. Um, the heirloom, I didn't, I didn't actually elaborate on those. Those are ones that, like I say, those are open pollinated. These are older varieties that, okay, I love tomatoes. You know that, because I said I eat them three times a day. Um, but some people will tell me that, oh, the heirlooms have so much better taste. 
I've tasted them and they're good. I don't know. I personally, I would not say they're better on that. Now they have some of the funky ones. You know, the Cherokee purple is a purple one. There's a black creme and it's kind of a black purple one. There is a uh, brandy wine, which is a pink one. It's a huge one. It's almost the size. It would be the size of say a, a little kid's uh, play football. You know, it's probably four or six inches across. It's big on that. So part of it depends on, on what you want as far as color and or, uh, you know, I would say try some of the, um, the heirlooms if you want to try them. And then you can tell, you can tell yourself, I think it's better or I think it's, it's okay. Um, I would highly recommend the heirloom ones getting them grafted because I have grown some of them ungrafted. I grew some Cherokee purple one year and I got three tomatoes. That was a lot of work for three tomatoes. So um, I would highly recommend on the grafted ones that you do, I'm, I'm sorry, on the heirlooms that you do a grafted tomato on that. And we usually get some in. We don't get every variety because of how many you have to get, but we do get some in um, grafted. And we also get some of the regular ones. The regular ones they graft are because they, they actually produce more, which is surprising on that. Your hybrid tomatoes, okay. Um, basically all your tomatoes except your heirlooms are hybrid on that. They've crossed A and B to get C on that. And so they're ones that, okay, if you want to save the seed, remember that, you know, you may or may not get something great and wonderful, but um, they, they've, they've, uh, they should be consistent from year to year to year on that. Um, okay. I'm going to jump a little bit. I, I haven't talked really about varieties. Um, I know, and I didn't tell you this, but if you have questions, put them in the chat and then I'll catch them at the end. Um, a lot of people ask about which tomatoes is the best to grow. Okay, now it's all personal preference. Okay, you talk to your neighbor who grows tomatoes and they have their favorite. You go to the farmer's market and they have their favorite. You talk to me and I have my favorite. Um, so, you know, experiment. If you have room for two or three, put two or three in. You know, I, I have gotten to the point, I don't really do that anymore. I used to do it just to play, but I have my favorite. And I will tell you my favorite, it's Jetstar. Um, I like it because the tomato is baseball size. Um, when I put tomatoes on a sandwich, I want tomatoes on a sandwich. I don't want one of these one slices like you buy at the restaurant. Um, I want the whole thing covered with tomatoes and I want to be able to taste them. So I use a whole Jetstar tomato for my sandwich on that. And then um, it's, it's an indeterminate. It grows up and down and around and you know, all over the place. But I have tomatoes all the time. And like last year, um, I usually plant two to three tomatoes. Um, last year I planted two tomatoes. Um, I had uh, tons to eat. I actually canned a few and then I froze some. And that, now that's one person with two tomatoes to give to two, two plants to give you an idea on that. Um, K-State does some studies sometimes and actually Missouri has two. And probably the last, uh, I don't know, five, seven years, Jets, it's, it's usually a, a uh, I don't know how to say a toss up, maybe a tie. There's usually a distinct leader, but it's not that much difference between Jetstar and Celebrity. Celebrity is a determinant. I don't plant it because I want the tomatoes all along. But, um, and it's, both of these are hybrids, but those are the two that show up in all the, you know, they'll, they'll give you the, sometimes the master gardeners do it, sometimes K-State does it, and they will um, actually grow the tomatoes and then weigh them how many they produce so they can say, okay, this and produce the most. And one of those two is usually the best or the, you know, one or two each year to give you an idea. But then, like I say, there's a bunch of other ones. Some people like early girl because it's a little earlier. Yeah, I think it's, I don't hold me to this, but I think it's lists as a week to 10 days earlier. Um, if you look at the tag, we'll talk about tags a second. The tag will tell you um, days to maturity on that. It'll say, and I don't know what it says, I'm making this up, 57. Okay, that means it's 57 days from when you plant it till you'll get um, tomatoes on that. Now, you can kind of speed that up by having good soil on that, and, and sometimes planting it early does get you a little advantage because uh, maybe you don't hit any of the cold weather and it takes off and goes. But it also has, um, you know, we talked about the grafted tomato having diseases. Um, your tag should also tell you It'll have initials there. Um, it'll say, and I don't remember who has what. So let's see if I can find one. Okay, yes, here's one. Okay, Jetstar. And then it says VF 
Okay, now there's VF, there's VF and T, and there's some new ones, I don't even know what they mean. And sometimes you'll see V1, V2, uh, N1, N2, T1, T2. Okay, those are diseases that the plant is resistant to. It doesn't have a problem with it. V stands for, for uh, verticillium, F is uh, fusarium, uh, T is tobacco, and N is nematodes. Okay, now, um, one of the things that you'll read on tomatoes and it tells you is to rotate your crops. Don't plant tomatoes in the same place every year. The question I always get is, I only have one place to put tomatoes. What do I do? Plant them, okay? And then you might pick one that has some disease resistance and we'll deal with it if you develop a problem. Um, remember I talked about the farmer's market, people using grafted tomatoes because of disease? They're putting them in the same place year after year after year. And they don't, their issue isn't the second year or the third year. It's probably the sixth, eighth, 10th, 15th year. And remember how many they're doing. They're planting 100 plants or 200 or 300. So don't worry about it right now. Say, okay, I'm going to plant them and um, we'll deal with it if the problem arises. Most of the time, the problems I see on tomatoes are more, they are diseases. If, well, if I have diseases, they're diseases that are not soil borne. In other words, they're not in the soil. They're, they come from the air, they come from an insect transmitting, or they came somewhere else as, as far as how they got there on that. So I say, don't worry about it. Plant tomatoes and if, we'll worry about it when the problem arises on that. So, um, so that's your, that, that's, if, if you've had problems or, or you're a little leery about it, that's what I would do is check the label. Cause it'll have that on the label on that. It'll, it'll tell you and, uh, uh, you know, they've got a lot of new ones now. Some of them have so many initials, it's almost like they have the PhD or something. So, but there's a lot of them. But getting back to different varieties, early girl is a little, like I say, it's a little earlier than some of the others. And there's usually as a general rule, the bigger the tomato, the longer it takes to ripen. You know, your big boy, your better boy, your um, brandy wine, those are going to take a while to get tomatoes because they're big. They're like your, um, uh, uh, you know, five or six pounds. They're pretty good size as far as that goes. So um, keep that in mind. And, and some of this is how you want to do it. You know, um, I don't personally like brandy wine. I mean, this sounds really weird. I love tomatoes, but I don't really care for it because it's pink on that. Um, another thing is it's a very large tomato and it's kind of shaped like a boat on that. And so sometimes when you take the core out of it, you take so much out of it, it's like, oh my God, there isn't much left because it was of the way it's shaped on that. So it depends on what you're doing. It doesn't make a great slicing tomato. You know, the Jetstar celebrity make a great slicing tomato because they are uh, uniform. You cut the core off and boom, it looks, you can slice it and it's a nice looking tomato. So part of it depends on how you want to do it. Uh, the Roma type, I haven't really talked about those. Those are more of a paste tomato or a sauce tomato. They're thick, they're not juicy. You know how you bite into a, a BLT and the juice runs down your cheek and it's like, oh, this is awesome. Um, that's the way, uh, those are not uh, the, uh, let me back up. The uh, Roma tomatoes will not be like that on that. They're gonna be thick. You cut those and they don't juice anywhere because you're gonna turn them into juice on that. So they don't, or I mean sauce, so they don't have a lot of, of juice in them on that. So. That's where, and they're a little bit longer. They're usually a very um, firm tomato compared to some of the others on that. So um, different types, and I didn't, I totally forgot about Roma. Sorry, I didn't write it down, so I didn't see it. Um, but uh, uh, a quick couple, because I know we're running out of time here. Uh, when I plant, and, and I, oh, I guess I'm gonna jump in, a, uh, sorry, I'm not in sequence here, but um, fertilizing tomatoes, I would fertilize, but I would not fertilize until they have started to bloom. Tomatoes will grow and you feed them and they're gonna grow. You're gonna have the nicest looking plant you have, except no tomatoes. I get every year I get somebody in and I say, well, you fertilize them? Yeah, I fertilize them a lot. Stop, do not fertilize until they start to bloom. Cause you're after the bloom, they need to be in the reproductive or blooming stage and then you can feed them and they'll grow more plus produce for you, uh, fruit on that. So um, what I usually do, remember I plant late and I plant big ones. I will take, when I dig my hole, I'm gonna plant them a foot deep. My beds are 15 inches deep. I go to the bottom of the bed. And then what I do is I put some slow release fertilizer at the bottom and then I put soil and then I put my tomato and bury it. Okay, 
now I'm in anywhere from four to six inches deeper than the, the root, the root uh, the bottom of the plant. The reason I do that is two things. I don't want the roots touching the fertilizer because it'll burn it, but I do not want, I don't want that plant to grow like the Dickens and not produce. So I put it deeper. So then the roots go down. And by the time the roots are down to where the fertilizer is, what's going to happen is the top is, is up there. It's, oh, it's, oh, it, the weather's nice. Everything's cool. I'm getting watered, I'm getting taken care of, and it'll be blooming by the time it hits that fertilizer. So then I have constant food for it. I will, I'm one that likes to push my, um, uh, push things. And so I will not, I will use the, the slow release, the garden coat, and when I, that's what I bury underneath the plant. And then I, remember I do this the end of May, and about the first of July, I will do a granular on top. Um, and I, according to the directions, I do that because I know that, okay, they're in raised beds. If you've done raised beds, you know, you water a lot. So I'm leaching some of it down. I want to make sure it has some. I also know when I put it on top, it's going to take a little bit of time to get down to the roots. So, um, I've got food there all the time for it. I will even supplement at times with a liquid that I water in once a week or so and mix it with water and water it in. Again, I want, I don't want those things to stop. On that, so I want to be able to um, uh, have them grow, 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 which means produce, produce, produce. So that's what I'm after on that. So, um, so that's kind of a quick one. Um, I don't really talk about disease or insects because let's deal with it with the time comes. And usually, you don't have many diseases or insects. Uh, if you can keep the temperature, not the temperature, the moisture and the fertilizer consistent, they'll keep growing and growing and growing for you. And that's kind of what you want. Uh, mulching them is not a bad idea. I wouldn't mulch right away. I would wait until about the middle uh, end of June to fertilize. I want, I mean, sorry, mulch. Uh, one of the things the mulch does is keep the soil cool, which is fine in July and August. You want them to grow really fast. And so if the soil is warm, they take off. This is a warm season plant. So they like it warm. So, you know, the, the mulch is going to help keep the weeds down. It'll help hold the moisture in, but I wouldn't do it super early. I would wait until it's nice and warm and then do it on that. Um, a word about, because we're about done, um, I don't have any chat things, so I'll, I'll go to the end as far as um, just talking. Uh, but um, a couple of things to keep in mind is tomatoes, as soon as they start to turn a little bit, you can actually pick them. Um, I pick mine, I call it really close. In other words, if they show any sign of ripening, they're starting to turn a little bit, I pick them. Uh, there's a lot of squirrels in the neighborhood and I'm not feeding the squirrels. So as soon as I, as they um, start to ripen, I pick them. They go in the house, I put them on the counter, a dark, cool place and let them and they'll ripen. And to me, they taste just as good as if you left them on the um, vine the whole time. Some people wanna leave them on the vine the whole time and that's fine. I know I have squirrel problems and I don't want them to get started. They don't seem to bother my tomatoes and I really suspect it's because I, uh, I pick them so close they don't know what they are on that. So, um, so uh, but uh, you know, again, I think to me personally, I think they taste as well whether you do it early or not on that. Um, so I do have a one quick question here. It says, can you explain a bit more about the kind of soil and how to set up a raised bed? Okay, I will say this. Tomorrow night, our, our um, uh, seminar is on raised beds, and but that's okay if you can't get onto it. But so, but the the soil you use. Remember that a raised bed is nothing more than a big pot. So um, you want a light soil. They do have. I mean, we carry a raised bed mix, which has topsoil in it, but it also has compost in it. It's a lighter mix. It has some core. The core is uh, helps hold the moisture. On that, all your raised beds will drain quicker because they're a lighter mix. And you want them to drain because you don't want to use just straight garden soil because it'll set up like adobe brick. So you want to mix it. If you want to mix your own, you can take your garden soil, but mix it about 50-50 with topsoil. Uh, or I mean, sorry, not topsoil, compost. 50-50, Top, compost and topsoil. So that it's a lighter mix. Or um, I have not figured it out lately, but the last time I figured it out, it was actually, in my opinion, a little cheaper to buy the raised bed mix because it has some, some nutrients, some minerals, and some um, fertilizer in it, and some humates and things like that, that if you buy a bag of that, it's much cheaper than, than um, trying to mix your own. So it'll be a light mix, but and actually on it, you just literally rip the bag open and dump it in, and you can plant right behind it. 
on that. So um, kind of give you an idea. I hope that actually um, uh, answered your question. The setup part, um, I would say, and that's all your vegetables, the more sun, the better on that. They'll take full sun and that's what they love and give it, you know, give them, if, you know, if you have to, if it's like an area that, okay, I have to decide what I want to do, you need at least a half a day and better, you know, maybe five, six hours of sun a day on that. If you have a choice between the east side and the west side, um, and, and your main crop is tomatoes, I would put it on the west side because they, like I say, they want the heat. So um, hopefully that helps you. Um, I'm going to say we're done. Now tomorrow night, remember, we're going to talk about raised beds. Um, I'll talk about location, kind of different ways you can build them, um, the soil mix, um, all that type of thing. Uh, next, after that, we're doing um, pruning fruit trees. We'll have that actually at the store alive, and we'll actually literally go out and prune fruit trees. And then we're going to do roses, and it's the same thing. We're going to go out and prune a rose, show you how to prune a rose. And then the last two after that, and I might have the order wrong, I think it's going to be container gardening and then um, pollinator gardening. So hopefully that helps. Um, thank you for listening. And hopefully we'll talk to you tomorrow at 6.30. Bye. Thank you, Ann. Appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Have a good evening. You Bye -bye. too. Uh, you know what we forgot to do.